Born in the hills of Avold. The city changes, but the river endures. back to another video this is the river medlock episode 5 and you join me on a journey where I'm following Manchester's river medlock from the east of the city across town across the city center to where it finally empties into the river Irwell now we started up at Phillips Park and I started there because it was kind of the eastern part of the city centre and I wanted to follow the specific route through the city centre so Phillips Park was a good place to start now this is number five and the number four ended at Holt Town Bridge. So we're going to follow the river now from Holt Town Bridge to Pinmill Brow just at the Manchester Inner Ring Road. Now the River Medlock is a very uncelebrated river. It's a medium sized river and when it gets into the city centre it's very very interesting. It's very inaccessible and it's almost in like man-made valleys because the buildings are really close up to its banks. And occasionally you may be walking down the street and you'll see a glimpse of it and off it'll go or it'll disappear into a culvert. So I wanted to get into it, under it, under its skin and follow it and find out all about it. So this section now from Holt Town Bridge down to Pinmill Brow which is the Manchester Inner Ring Road is, I suppose if you like, it's the Ancoat section. So we'll be looking at the river but we might be veering away from it slightly because there's some very interesting things in Ancoats that are just by the river. So let me show you on a map just exactly where we are and the section we're going to cover. Okay so I appreciate some of you don't know Manchester so if you pause that for your Google Maps you'll know where we are. Here's the area again and there's Holt Town Bridge where the cursor is and you'll see that the river just kind of meanders along there all the way down to the Manchester Inner Ring Road which is Pinmill Brow, okay? Um, now, if we look at the hybrid, which shows sort of like what the land is like, you'll see there, it's very green, and the river, where's the cursor? There it is. The cursor just shows you there, that area again, and it's almost very green, and it's, there's not a lot going on at the moment in the river, it just runs through all these trees, and quite nice area, to be honest with you, to say it's so cl close to the city centre. So to go in the river, there's not a lot going on. So what we'll do is we'll look at the area around where we're, where the river goes. And that is Ancoats, like I say. So let's start at the beginning, get back to basics. That name, Ancoats, where did that come from? Okay, just quickly, firstly, this map is probably the best map ever. This map is a 1793 map. Now you'll see there, there's the Medlock and it says from the Lime Kilns. So two places I'm going to refer to a lot. That from the Lime Kilns is now Lime Kiln Lane. And that's where I filmed the opening sequence to this uh, video. You'll see there Mr. Meredith's Pin and Paper Manufacturing. Well, where it says Ancoats Bridge, that area and the road just up uh, above it is now known as Pin Mill Brow. So maybe it's all down to Mr. Meredith's pin and paper manufacturing, eh? Um, lime kilns. I had to find out what they were for. Apparently they were to make quick lime. Uh, they burnt lime and they made quick lime with them. And it was used in um, building houses. Um, they used it as like a mortar. But the name, the name Ancoats, where does that come from? So let's take a slow walk up Ancoats Lane which, believe it or not, is now the semi-motorway that we know as Great Ancoat Street, if you know Manchester at all. But if you look at it, look at it, it's almost semi-rural. Open fields. Right, so the name Ancoats. I'm going to read this to you. 
The second element of the name Coates or Coat, C-O-T-E, is generally thought to be derived from the Anglo-Saxon cota, meaning either a cottage or an enclosure for livestock. The prefix an, A-N, is from the Anglo-Saxon to give, and thus the name Ancoats means given or gifted cottages or enclosures. Um, there are various other theories, but that one seems to make the most sense. There was another theory, um, it was from someone's name, Anna, the dwelling of Anna, but apparently that was never actually proved and it's without evidence. Um, so, Ancoats Lane, you're looking there, um, it's Obviously, it's semi-rural, little fields, occasional streets. There you go, Segor Booth's land. Um, absolutely, completely different to the way we know it now. Now, as Ancoats developed and industry started to move in, by 1788, Ancoats Lane became known as Great Ancoats Street. So there's how we got the name Ancoats. And we'll see that Great Ancoats Street started off as Ancoats Lane in 1788. It became Great Ancoat Street as it elevated in its status around the industrial area. So this is Lime Kiln Lane. And oh my God, how a place can change. In fact, I suppose it's almost come full circle because when you look at it on the very old maps, it's probably imagine it would be a little bit like this. But if you look at it late 1800s, early 1900s, it's unbelievable, it's just like a normal street, a normal road with factories on it. There's a massive railway bridge going over it. Um, there's, I think there's streets up here behind me on the hill and there's a big, what looks like a school. In fact, I've got a photo I can show you taken from Pin Mill Brow, looking down Lime Kiln Lane. And you would never believe it, this was the same, the same sort of, I'm in the same place. But all around is evidence, to be honest with you. Um, I'm looking for where the old railway bridge used to be at the moment. Um, there is a wall behind me there, but I'm not sure whether it was the railway bridge because the railways that brought the goods lines out of Ancoats goods station uh, came across here somewhere. I'm just in the undergrowth there behind me is the remains of an old wall. So I really don't know what that was. I would love to see what it was like. I've looked up pictures for Lime Kiln Lane and I can't find anything um, this far into Lime Kiln Lane. Don't know what this was, some kind of wall here. Uh, can't have been the railway bridge because it's got sort of top stones on it. Um, but this is what it's like. You know that there was something here before. Occasionally the, the tarmac comes off the path I'm walking on and you see cobbles. Over there there's a, a wall just broken down. So I'm just leaving Lime Kiln Lane now. I'm going to head over to where Ancoats Hall used to be. And it's just literally across the road here. This is Lime Kiln Lane meeting um, Great Ancoats Street. So that little overgrown sort of semi-rural lane I've just been walking down. This is how it used to look. <laughs> walk across Palmerston Street now to that clump of trees behind me to the site of what was Ancoats Hall. So it's written that the hall had beautiful views across the valley down to the River Medlock. Well that was about to change wasn't it? So here's a more modern map, uh, 1888 on the left, modern day on the right. As we've left Lime Kiln Lane, we walk up Great Ancoat Street there. Just under the railway bridge, or what was the railway bridge, there is, says Manchester Art Museum. Now, you'll notice on the right, it's just a green field. 
but on the left it says Manchester Art Museum. Manchester Art Museum was Ancoats Hall. And there it is. Now apparently that is the later hall. The original early hall was a timber frame building and um, in 1609 apparently that was built and it was built by the Mosley family who were the great uh, lords of the manor in Manchester and they bought it from the land from the Byram family who apparently were related to the poet Byram. So the Mosley family lived there till about the 1780s and then they decided that the whole area was becoming quite industrialised and not conducive for rural living and they headed south and they sold the hall and then it was owned by the new rich which was George Murray of the nearby Murray Mills. He'd made a fortune in the cotton industry and he bought the old hall, demolished it and built this thing that you see now, this brick built building in 1827. By 1868 the Murrays had gone and it had a brief period where it was owned by the Midland Railway Company and then in 1886 a Mr Thomas Coglan Horsfall opened it as the Manchester Art Gallery. He was a philanthropist and there was all sorts that went on there. There was lectures, there was children's shows. It was very much an open house and he believed in educating people and sharing art and education with, with the masses, basically. Sounds like a really, really um, enlightened person. So this is what it was like inside. Um, looks really really interesting anyway it was manchester art gallery until about 1954 and then basically the art gallery closed and it was absorbed into the art gallery i think on mosley street uh, in manchester and into the whitworth art gallery and then in the 1960s the hall had fallen into disrepair and can you believe it yes it was demolished Things, the, the things that we've done in the past day, Manchester's so much to answer for. Anyway, just another quick interesting point. If you saw a video that I did called Stories from Beyond the Grave, I talked about the Manchester mummy. Now, Hannah Beswick was known as the Manchester mummy, and she was a middle-class lady that had her own doctor, and she had a fear of being buried alive, which was quite common at the time. I think we're going back about 200 years. And she requested that she not be buried, but she be uh, kept for a while until her body was certain to be dead. And Dr. White agreed to this and he basically mummified a body. And for a while, that body was kept in uh, Ancoats Hall until it eventually went on display at one of the museums. But that story is in my uh, video called Stories from Beyond the Grave Hannah Beswick, the Manchester Mummy. <laughs> And all around, evidence of the railways <clears throat> that dominated this, this scene completely. Very different back in the 1900s, early 1900s. You see the bridge there, the top of the bridge? That was the lines that came across from uh, Ancoats Goods Yard, Goods Station, and came across there and then went over to over the River Medlock and over Lime Kiln Lane where we was earlier on. But this area if I show you pictures, it was completely and utterly different. OK, that is Palmerston Street there, where the red car is. I'll just show you how it's changed. Now, there's a corker for you. So, that is Palmerston Street as well. And where the black car is, is where the red car was parked. So, we're looking from a different angle. But, look at the change in that. And, uh, look at the bridge there. That's how the railways dominated the area. And what a corker of a picture with the steam train on top. Do you remember at the beginning of the video where I said look at the River Medlock in this section? It's almost rural, it flows through almost Greenbelt. Well this aerial shot was taken just to the east of the River Medlock. Look at it, just hundreds and hundreds of terrace streets. Incredible.
So these vast mills behind me, Murray Mills and the Royal Mills Complex, are some of the earliest mills in Ancoats, built by, and let me introduce you to, two Scottish brothers, Adam and George Murray, and two other Scottishmen, James McConnell and John Kennedy. They were the Scotsmen that built these mills. Now let me tell you a little bit about them. Now these four gentlemen came from the Scottish borders and the parents must have been quite canny people because they knew there wasn't much of a future for their, their sons uh, in the Scottish borders. It, there were small villages and there wasn't much work. So they sent them to Manchester to serve apprenticeships. And in fact, they ended up in workshops in Lee and they served machine building apprenticeships and they must have learnt the craft really, really well because they became masters of what they did. And when the, the time served, they came to Manchester and they revolutionised the cotton industry and they ended up amassing a fortune and building these mills. Now, one of the reasons why they were so successful was because they were very good at what they did. They took two desi designs of spinning machine at the time and they made a hybrid that was much more effective. And that's why it was called the spinning mule, because it was a hybrid of two uh, already established machines. Not only did they do that, they adapted the machine to work and be steam powered. So no longer were, was your mill uh, dependent on a water source like a river or a brook. Suddenly now you were independent of that and your machines could work off steam and they could run faster and more efficient. And they built these machines for their own mills and they built them for other people's mills and they became incredibly wealthy. Um, and that's why um, Mr. Murray ended up buying Ancoats Hall, demolishing it and rebuilding it. Now, as well as being very good at what they did, let's not over, over uh, exemplify them because they were described as ruthless as well. And obviously they thought nothing of employing children, which was the thing at the time. Um, the lowest paid and unskilled workers unpacked the cotton in an apparently suffocating environment. People worked 12 hour plus days, Monday to Friday, nine hours on a Saturday. They got Sunday off. The most skilled workers, which were the spinners, were encouraged to bring their children into the factory and tr they, they were trained up and seen as a good um, supply of adult workers for the future. So, yeah, they were very good at what they did, but they didn't give any special benefits to the um, the workers uh, like some other philanthropists did. Some other phila philanthropists provided housing and health care for the workers. These chaps didn't. So, yes, it was it's a great set of mills. It's a lasting legacy. But like most of the mill owners and the rich at the time, I don't want to get too political, they basically, people were just work fodder. Now apparently these mills are built without foundations, but I think that was the thing at the time. Some of the old Terry streets were built without foundations as well. I think they dug down deep and then just laid brick onto the earth. Now back in 2000, 2002, 2003, before these mills were turned into residential complexes, they held an open day when they were doing them up. And I came down here, fortunately with my camera, but it was a film camera. We got inside and I took a load of pictures. Let me see if I can dig them out for you. So there you go, I've been in my drawers and dug out my old Max Spielman envelopes and I found them. So these are photographs of photographs. So, you know, don't, uh, don't expect too much on the quality. But this was an open day, I think 2002, 2003, where they invited the public into the uh, Royal Mills complex, Murray Mills complex, and to have a look round before they did them all up for the residential use that they are now. As you can see, I was obsessed with the chimney there. Um, these are the best ones to be honest with you. There's a couple on the inside there as well, but uh, quite a fascinating day. I wish I had a video of it to be honest with you, but there you go. Right, this is why I like old buildings. I like new buildings as well, but this is why I like old buildings because of the effort that went in. This rather beautiful building behind me that is now uh, an office for a construction company was built in 1911 as an electricity substation. Look at it, it's amazing. Now, back in 1793, when you and I had our little stroll along Ancoats Lane, you may or may not have noticed something. Um, a little stream, and it's not the Medlock. It is the legendary Shooter's Brook. 
It is legendary because it is one of Manchester's lost waterways in that it's now been buried, culverted and has lost forever. So in a way it's a bit like the River Tib. Here it is flowing just to the north of the city here, well I say city, the fields to the north of Ancoats and we're around about Miles Platin here and on this part of the map. So we run into the city here and it runs kind of like down almost alongside Oldham Road. I'll show you in a bit. And it, then it runs sort of underneath Great Ancoat Street. But like I say, it's legendary because it is no more. It's not been seen for many, many years. And I'm talking maybe 200 years or something like that. So can we find any evidence of Shooter's Brook, this legendary lost Manchester waterway? Now, here's an interesting fact and a side story for you. There's an area of Manchester called Miles Platin. Have you ever wondered where Miles Platin got its name from? Well, it's all down to Shooter's Brook. Let me explain. Okay, so over to my most favourite book in the world, The Lost Rivers of Manchester. And the book is almost as elusive as the rivers it talks about. <laughs> if you can get all that book for under, under 20 quid, I'll give you a jam butty. Anyway, let's read this passage. From under Picard Street, the brook turns abruptly southwards and passes under Oldham Road at Varley Street. Here, when Oldham Street was Newton Lane and Varley Street was Cow Lane, the brook ran open across the road and in wet weather, rushes, planks or plattings were laid across the river to enable easier passage. And so... As this point was almost exactly one mile from Manchester, the appellation Miles Platin was given and has survived to give its name to the township. Now, I was completely blown away when I read that. I loved it. I think it's amazing. It's such an unusual name when you think about it, Miles Platin. But that little story behind it is, uh, is brilliant. <laughs> so I'm just stood by the Ashton Canal on the aqueduct that goes over Store Street in Manchester. And this aqueduct plays a role in the Shooter's Brook story. So if we just go down below, I'll tell you about it. So the aqueduct is a grade two listed structure built in 1797 by Benjamin Outram, who was the then chief engineer of the Ashton Canal Company. Now, although it currently spans Store Street, guess what it was originally built to span? You guessed it. That aqueduct there was originally built to span Shooter's Brook. And then later, Store Street was built over, over the brook, and the brook is now in its little culvert down, down below street level. So I guess sort of standing here 200, 250 years ago, I'd have been standing or wading in the middle of Shooter's Brook. Okay, so you can relate to where Shooter's Brook went through the city centre. Here's an 1807 map, and we're going to overlay it on a modern map. See where the brook is there underneath the Ashton Canal? When I phase the modern day mapping, keep your eye on that, see what it is. Okay, ready to go? We're going to phase in the modern map now. See? Store Street with the Ashton Canal going over it. And we'll just fade back to the 1807 map again. And you can see the brook there meandering. And see Shooter's Brow and Bank Top. Well, what are those today? So if we phase back, London Road, okay? And then the only thing we've got to relate to on the old map there is Granby Row. That's very old. Um, but yes, Shooter's Brow and Bank Top. Now this is Piccadilly Place in Manchester and just across the way there is uh, Piccadilly Station and I found a shred of evidence of when they were putting one of the deep, deep retaining walls in that were going to support this building. I found a shred of evidence on the uh, construction company's website of what they encountered deep below ground here. A number of challenges emerged during the wall and anchor installation. The area was congested with underground services including abandoned culvert of Shooter's Brook just below the excavation level. So I'm just walking down Granby Row in Manchester and Granby Row is very very old 
and at one time this would have been open where the brook used to run and would have been walking along by the hazelnut trees and probably having a bit of a paddle. Now we know Shooter's Brook used to meander its way through the city centre and it's now culverted deep deep down below the city streets and it's probably been probably been straightened out as well so as you're walking through the streets you know roughly the route but you don't know where it is that is until you get here into Sackville Gardens just near Canal Street in Manchester and I've got a little bit of knowledge because there's a manhole cover I'm going to go and see if I can find it and it stands above Shooter's Brook So that rather unassuming manhole cover just stands above Shooter's Brook and the reason I know that is is because there was some kind of study done around here of the, the what's underneath the ground that's sort of like the foundations I think it was for some building project they were doing and they sent a man down there with a camera and they followed the route for, for a while and it was that um, they came up from that uh, manhole cover there not quite sure where they got in if I remember where they got in or if I can find out I'll put it down below but it's wonderful that you can stand in Sackville Gardens up on top of that manhole just for a few moments and know that deep down below you, nine meters below you, is Shooter's Brook. Anyway, we must move on because not far from here, I'm just near Whitworth Street now, and not far from here, Shooter's Brook finally runs into the Medlock. Let me go and show you where it is. Now I'm here just off Whitworth Street at the back of India House and the River Medlock is just to my right deep down below me here. Now apparently it's here in this area just behind Whitworth Street that Shooter's Brook finally runs into the River Medlock. Now when you read up on it it says that it ran into the Medlock near Garrett Hall. Now I've got a sketch somewhere I want to show you, it's a very old sketch of Garrett Hall. Now Garrett Hall is ancient, it was stood in ruins apparently in the late 1700s, so it's long since gone. Why was it called Garrett Hall? Well apparently around here, the Roman roads to York and to Stockport began, and there was some kind of Roman military presence around here. Hence years later in the Middle Ages, you had Garrett Hall. Now, Obviously when Shooter's Brook ran open and this place was very, very different, it just ran, it was not, it was like a normal riverbank and it just ran into the River Medlock. But years later, apparently it's written that Shooter's Brook in its culvert ended up running into Duke's Tunnel. Now Duke's Tunnel is just down here behind me and if you watch my video Lost Waterways of Manchester, I talk all about Duke's Tunnel. But Apparently the brook runs into Duke's Tunnel and then Duke's Tunnel is just, just this, this tunnel here just off the Medlock. Quite fascinating stuff but again the elusive Shooter's Brook even when it enters the Medlock we still can't see it because it enters the Medlock deep deep inside a very very old inaccessible tunnel. <laughs> These things are sent to try us. Okay, back to the book, The Lost Rivers of Manchester, and this is a really interesting uh, snippet of information I've found. The brook, meaning Shooter's Brook, and the tunnel, meaning Duke's Tunnel, were very close together on the ground, now covered by Sir Joseph Whitworth's works, now Whitworth Street. There was a weir on the brook about there, and boys when bathing were accustomed to pass by an underwater opening from the brook into the tunnel and bring out coal from a sunken boat at that time lying in the tunnel. So difficult to picture what's going on there. The brook and the tunnel are extremely close. They've found some sort of adjoining tunnel, they're going through there, 
and the nicking uh, coal off a barge that's sunken there inside Duke's Tunnel because that was a tunnel that took coal up to Bank Top, which is now a uh, Piccadilly Station approach. So is there any evidence around here of Garrett Hall and what this area used to be? Well, there is some very, very modern day evidence and I'll show you now. So that's it for episode 5. Now we're at Pin Mill Brow and the River Medlock now enters right into the heart of the city centre. And that's pretty much the sort of flavour for the rest of these uh, the series of videos about the Medlock. We'll be going through the city centre of Manchester and seeing where the Medlock meanders. Mm -hmm.